I'm starting. And I'm videoing because I accidentally deleted the first period video. Oh my god. Solid. Draw sulfur, hexa, or uh, tetrafluoride. First thought you have to do is what? So, how many? 34. 34, okay. Middle. Okay, so now fluorine everywhere. Or, or, and then. So, 32 all the way, right? And then you say lone pair, right? And then this is where I like for you to say, Vincent Lovely look, sure. there's a lone pair circle. <laughs> but I want to not give you your credit. Okay, so if you had to guess the shape? Oh, uh, no, well, it's something, it's, it's like a. Uh, think about it. Tetrahedral. No, it's not tetrahedral, it's a lone pair. Square. square. It, so we have four ligands one, two, three, four, and one lone pair. Sea salt. You have to think about it in your head. If you want to build it on the test, if you just can't figure it out, I'll let you. In my orgo class, I have my own little kit, and they were allowed to bring our own kit kits to the test. And if you could orgo, you have to visualize massive structures. And if you couldn't do it, you would fail the test. So he was like, you bring your structures and you waste your time building, but you'll understand what it is. So if you need some structure to build with, just let me know on test day. But it takes some practice to really kind of wrap your head around the 3D structure. The way I think about it is I think about the fact that there's an axial region and there's an equatorial region. And that's it. X, Y, Z axis is all we're really talking about. So the best arrangement for the lone pair is to be as far away from the bonded pairs as possible. There's only really one place it can be here, though, because I know for sure I'm going to have two bonds on the axial region. So one, two, gone. So then I have three things that have to take up space in the middle region, right? So two bonds and one lone pair. So they have to take the space in the middle region because the middle region is a total 360, right? But split three ways is 120. So this is 120 from here, this is 120 from the lone pair, and the, one, and the lone pair is 120 from this one. Technically it's a little less than 120, I'm sorry, this angle here is a little less than 120 because the lone pair has extra repulsive power, so it pushes these, these closer together. So think about it. We, we'll practice a lot with the bronze and stuff too. But yeah, that's the sea salt one. And that sea salt, is that molecular geometry or electron group geometry? It's molecular because all we are considering is the stuff you can see. What can you see? The ligands, the atoms, which make up the molecule. The lone pair is not really, I mean, it's part of the molecule, but we, when we say molecular geometry, we're counting the atoms and seeing where they are existing after the repulsion has occurred. Now, if you think about and visualize a lone pair right here, what's the shape of this one? It's, oh, it's a bipyramidal. Bipyramidal, it's a bipyramidal, right. So that's where I get two shapes from. For seesaw, you know, for seesaw, you're talking about the molecular geometry, the electron group geometry, we call uh, trigonal bipyramidal or just bipyramidal. Okay, so that's sometimes just the name both of them. Um, and then give any angles you know. We'll just talk about some of them, but we're going to go in depth with that, so I'm going to skip that for now. I'm also going to skip the trifluoride. Delocalized. If I asked you to tell me what delocalized based on, based on your knowledge of the Lewis structure of benzene, what would you say? Uh, it's something oh, like that. Okay, so what's the word delocalized mean? Period. It's not set location. These localized means I'm not local. I'm not, lo I'm not located in this specific lo location. So that's why we can draw benzene like this or like this or so those are two resonant structures or the cheap way like this. The 
show me that those electrons are anywhere within that double air that, uh, cyclic ring. But delocalized, we're going to talk about in more in depth about pi bonds or uh, double bonds, where they don't have a specific location. They can rotate around or they are free to move. All right, so molecular polarity is the only like thing I haven't actually told you about the bonding part. Before you actually copy this down, before we can even think about the molecular polarity, you have to know these three things. You have to know the valid Lewis, Lewis structure, right, and how you validate it based on the formal charge. You have to know the bond polarities, which you know, the sheets I gave you in honors chem that have a little electronegativity on it. For some of you, that some of you guys may have seen it in your textbook. I can give you those to start looking at now, but you will not get them on the AP exam, period. You have to know general electron negativities to determine bond polarity. So that's just simply saying, we call it change in EN, or electronegativity. It's based on like, um, like HCl definitely has a dipole moment because this bond between H and Cl is covalent, but chlorine is way more electronegative. Way more electronegative means it's going to be hoarding the electrons more so, and then the HCl is going to be the positive end of the bond there. And then after that, you determine the geometry. And I don't say molecular or electron group here, I'm just saying geometry in general, so you know the shape of the molecule. After you know these three things, then you can then determine the molecular polarity because you can't determine it first. I mean, we've all memorized water is polar because we know it's polar. So if you describe why, you'd be saying, oh, it looks like this. It's got two lone pairs. Two lone pairs are very negative. The H's are very positive. Oxidants is polar. So that's what I just did in three steps. But we know it's polar. And then after you determine the molecular polarity, next week we're going to start talking about IMS. You can't do IMS until you talk about molecular polarity. And then you can't do physical properties, like boiling point, melting point, um, surface tension, that kind of stuff. You can't do that until you know IMS. So there's a flow here. Okay, so people in the video can't see that, but they hear me. Um, molecular polarity, though, the way you talk about it or indicate the, the polarity of the entire molecule is you draw an overall dipole moment on the, on the molecule. So here's water. Again, the overall dipole moment, usually we draw a line straight through the middle of the molecule, like this. Or you can put it on the side to show the general region of positivity and the general region of negativity. So hydrogens are the partial positives on both sides here, and oxygen is an, a partial negative. So that's why we draw the dipole moment from bottom to the top like that. Um, another way of indicating dipole moment is this mu symbol, like that. Sometimes with a line on it, and that's just just in case you ever see it. Um, I don't think on the AP exam they'll label it like that, but when you get to big boy college stuff, you'll see it like that. Another thing. Um, the, the strength of this dipole is measured in Debye's, not Dubai like the city, but Debye's, the unit. So Debye's are coulomb meters because it's an area of charge because you have electrons there. And it's a distance because it depends on how far the bond is apart because of the you know, atomic radii or atomic radius of each of the components. So it's based on two things. Um, I only put this here because on the AP exam they're going to be giving you data, and data usually comes with units. So they might say, oh, here's the molecular dipole for blah, 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 and they're going to give it, you'll probably give you the units of device. So I don't want that to be something if you see it there. But I, will, I don't, usually will not ask you to measure out device. I probably will never ask you to write device. It's just in case you see it. All righty. Yeah. You mentioned the 6.3 kilos. Is that XL or what? No, times 10. Sorry, times 10 to the negative 30th. <clears throat> it's extra large. Oh, and I have to get t shirt sizes today, by the way, for next week. So I'm going to buy t shirts for, t for our, sorry, our bonding application class. Oh, there's a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm going to scroll down here first before you see the top. So uh, the halogens are generally what they would use for bond polarity because it's very drastic, like that's a given. These are very electronegative and everything to the left or at the left of the halogen group is not as electronegative. So if they give you data like this and they give you all your halogen or um, your their acids, but the, all your halogens bonds, the bond lengths, the electronegativity differences in the dipole moments, how would you connect the dots here? What a kind of um, statement could you make based on this information? The bond lengths, the lowest electronegativity 
difference and the lower than five thing is. Okay, so what does this tell you about the structure of the molecule? Okay, all of these are actually single bonds, but that is right. Longer bonds are the, sorry, the single bonds are the longest bonds. <clears throat> That's a good point. I'm going to talk about that on Monday. What else can you indicate about the structure of the molecule? Okay. So, the, but where are we getting this long bond from? Look at your, look at your, your structures here. Oh, the farther down the group you go, the longer the bond is. Atomic radius, thank you. The farther down the group, right, atomic radius increases down a group. So the atomic radius is actually the trigger point. So the, the atomic radius causes the bond length to be the, you know, the change of the bond length. So the larger the, the atoms, the longer the bond length. And guess what is inverse atomic radius? Well, that's not too, that's, that's true, negativity. but yeah. Electronegativity. So the larger the atoms, the smaller the electronegativity of that particular atom, which creates a situation where you have a long bond length, which doesn't really matter here. It's the fact that the electronegativity is smaller in this corner of the periodic table, so it creates a small electronegative difference. Small electronegative difference creates a small dipole moment for the entire molecule here. And all these, all of these are linear, like uh, HF or versus HI, except this one's like really little and this one's like huge. Okay, so this is going to be easily broken off, which we talked about with bond dissociation energies too. Um, HF has a high electronegativity difference because of the electronegative nature of fluorine which creates a bigger dipole moment. And a lot of times they'll indicate the size of the dipole moment based on the length of the arrow they draw. Okie dokie. So there's like five different things we can talk about here that you can connect the dots when you're smart people. There's smart people in school. Excuse by the way. Oh, I'm actually just gonna let you see that in words too if you need to write any of that down. So we just talk about it so you need to. I tell people that all the time now. I was like, yeah, maybe you should pretty much the smart people in school. So you may not know everything about physics or biology or calculus, but still, it's more interesting. Okay. The area of the, the vastly different colors means that their electronegativity is very different. So we have like purple over here and red over here. This is hydrofluoric acid, so it has a very long, strong dipole. And hydroionic acid has green and green. So there's very little difference in their electronegativity, so they have small dipoles. So you, I think you can say fountain color, I don't know what any color, but I'll give you size differences. <clears throat> okay, last thing about polarity, I uh, just talked about these over there on the board, but if you need to write down any of that, you can. Uh, the only thing I haven't said is about the cancellation. So water is polar because the two lone pairs are on top. Not really on top, they are together. We have the tetrahedral structure tetrahedral structure like this, it doesn't matter where I take the bonds off. I take them off here, there's still two bonds down here, two lone pair up here. I take them off here, it doesn't matter where I turn it. So there's no way to split bonds because this structure does not allow for the structure or for the bonds to be like one symmetrically on one side or the other. So I can take off one here and one here and it still doesn't matter. The structure still has two uh, ligands and the lone pairs are up top. That's what tetrahedral structure is. Therefore, a lot of times when you have a lone pair on tetrahedral, it's definitely going to be polar. It doesn't matter what you do to it. So, if you have something that's um, like a linear structure, and oops, and both of the atoms are the same, there is no dipole moment. Therefore, the bond polarity is nonpolar, covalent. So, the bond polarity causes this entire thing to not even have a possibility of being polar. And it's the same atom, so it can't be polar because there's no uh, difference in the distribution of electrons. Um, another linear structure, carbon dioxide, where are the dipole moments pointing towards for the bonds? Hmm. Think about the electronegativity. Right, so this is linear. So what I did was I have my Fred Lewis structure, I have my bond uh, bonds figured out. These are actually, I'm gonna draw these right here on here. 
these are actually the bond polarities outward and outward. So they're pointing in opposite directions. The geometry is linear, so it's aligned for this can the cancellation of these two bond polarities, which makes the entire molecule wet or what? Not polar, right? Because of the cancellation, because they're, um, they're negating one another's uh, pool on the central atom. Hydrochloric acid. Where's the overall dipole moment? To the right. Definitely very polar. There's no cancellation even possible there. Sulfur trioxide. How many electrons? 24. So if I do that, what's going to happen now? Okay, I could put lump here, but then I'm going to have six on sulfur and that's it. If I put a lump here on sulfur, then I have 26 electrons. Double on, thank you. You should be thinking ahead of once you put all these lump pairs on here, how many electrons do you have? So that's the one of the Lewis uh, resonance structures, and then rotate that bond to be to represent all of them. Um, what's the shape of this one? Trigonal planar. Thank you. This is simple. All you're doing is looking at the central atom and saying how many legs does it have? It's got three legs. And if they, there's no lone pair to push them away, there's no, there's no poss other possible arrangement except for them to actually, if they could take up a flat gravity space, they can, because in this case, they'll be 120 degrees apart on all sides because of the, I mean, if you put them like this, it would be 90 degrees and that's too close. You're going to put them flat, so they can go one, two, three, and create that, take that, that 360 degree equatorial region. So this one's going to be trigonal, trigonal planar, and since it is trigonal planar, each of these bonds will be pulling out towards the oxygen equally in all directions. I know this, is a, this has a double bond here, but we know that this is not actually true. This is an average. Remember how those resonance structures are an average? So equally pulling all directions. So what would you say? Polar or non-polar? Polar. Equally pulling in all directions. So if I was if I was to look at the electrons in my little 360 area here, electrons, 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 everybody's equally distributed. So it's not polar. It looks like it's unequally distributed because I got two lone pairs here and three here and three here, but this is a lie, right? There's an average that exists for this resonance. But this is this this is usually we start usually draw it just like right when you start to think about it you just put your lines this actually looks like this the bonds are 120 120 120 so they're equally apart okay it's about the distribution as well okay um, I'm gonna skip um well that's much shape but it's true just do that one tetrahedral I showed you if they're all the same bonds they all cancel each other out as well because the equal distribution of all electrons. The polar molecule, though, you can see like this is water. You draw your electro, um, I mean your uh, document right straight through. Well, let's do the, the bound angles, though. That's the only thing we have left to do. I'm going to skip this these drawings for a little bit because you guys can do this later. I'm going to skip that for now, too. I'll go back. All right, this is on the bonding sheet that I gave you. It's just one piece of paper. It's a big, big humongous chart. Once you guys have sketched these as 3D as you possibly can, and I'll give you some helpful hints on those. Um, but I'm just going to walk through the, the, the structures and then the angles. So you guys keep up as you're sketching, and I'll give you some examples for each of these in a second. So when it says effective electron pairs, let's just think electron domains. Electron domains. So the first one, you only have two, I mean, two places where these atoms can go, left and right. So a good example of this one, anybody? So that's the one where it's on left and right. 
and I don't show the double bonds here, but you've got your um, bonded region here and a bonded region here. The only way that if you don't have any lone pairs pushing these atoms, the only way they're going to arrange themselves is as far apart as possible, which is 180 degrees in this case. So from left to right, it's 180. From bottom to top, it's 180. doesn't matter which way you look at it. If you have an unshared pair, so like if this was two shared, which means two bonded, if you have an unshared pair, it would be different, and I'll get to that maybe in a second. So the next version is if you have three electron domains, if you have three electron domains and you have three bonds, for this one, three bonds, then equally space them out in a flat plane. And that gives us trigonal planar at 120 at every day. A short way of writing bonding was this little alligator looking thing like this. Just by the way. This means bond angle. So you can just put bond angle 120 or whatever you gotta do. Um, if you have, so this is kind of goes back between electron group geometry and molecular geometry. All I'm doing here is replacing one of these bonds with a lone pair. So the areas where these bonds are located are staying exactly the same place. Notice that also all I did was take off the top bond and leave the two bottom bonds here, putting in the electron group. The electron pair is huge, and it's very negative. So it does some extra repulsion on the bonded pairs because it doesn't want those bonded pairs to be as close to the lone pair because the lone pair takes up more space and it just has more repulsive force. So that's why you see this one says less than 120. It's like 118, I think, something like that. That one usually um, they do say if you're trying to indicate so that's that the bond angle is 100, you know, something below 120, they're good with you just saying less than 120. They don't need specifics. On this particular one, another name for this, though, is, look at it, bent. So bent and angular are the same thing. If you ever see the word angular, it's kind of just a old-timey way of saying bent. Good to go? So far, these have been flat. No 3D, really 3D shape at all. I'm also going to give you examples as I go here, but I'll let you copy that first. The first one. Boron trifluoride for that first one that we just did up there with the trigonal planar. And then. So this is where the 3D straight shape comes in. I'm going to draw it without the bubbles for a minute just to show you. Actually, I'll do it over here. I'll show you how the tetrahedral looks in the 3D realm. I've, I've drawn it like this a couple times. So you may have caught on. You draw two of them in the plane because that's like looking at you X and Y axis. Two of the legs in the lane, in the plane. And then you draw one of them coming forward. And you can draw it with like a little bolded line or a bolded triangle that shows it's coming out of the board at you. And then the dash line to show that one of them is coming, going into the board, away from you. So that's kind of how you indicate your 3D structure on just single bonds like that. Double bonds are a little bit harder. But the tetrahedral arrangement has a specific bond angle that you must memorize. It's 109.5. It's very specific. And that's because my tetrahedral shape it doesn't go flat. It's like a cross. This is not tetrahedral. Who knows the shape of this one? It's just flat and a cross. That doesn't fit into the foundation. Square planar. This is square planar. Tetrahedral looks like this. It's like this bonding all the way around. Okay, so you've got square planar. I mean, uh, tetrahedral is 109.5 all the way around. Doesn't matter where you go. There is no 93 angle on that piece at all. Question. So the shape thing, if we. 
doing the shape um, like without the circle stuff. Um, is that do we do the one on the right or the left? I prefer this one because it's what you'll be expect to do in college anyway. So it gives you good practice. Um, because that looks, you know, they did they did a good job of showing the bond from the back, but it looks more two D. This one's supposed to look more three D. Whatever works for you. Um, this one right here, you'll notice that all we did was take off one bond and put it on a lone pair. Lone pair has extra repulsive power, so it does push down on these angles just a little bit. So if I was this tetrahedral shape, get my ballerina on here, and the lone pair was on top, it actually pushes these bonds just together just a little bit. So all these bonds are crunched together now. Tetrahedral has a special way of declining its angle. It goes down by 2.5 each time you add a lone pair. So this one is 107. So it just shrinks it just, just a little bit, but enough to do some damage whenever you're trying to tell people the correct bond angle. If you go down more, you go down one more bond. What does this one remind you of? What, what a common molecule. Thank you. Water. Um, this one was uh, ammonia, by the way. A uh, good example, carbon tetrachloride for the first one. So water has two lone pairs, and that's what I was trying to show you earlier. It doesn't matter where you put the lone pairs. They're all, they're, you know, as this rotates in 3D space, it's all going to be exactly the same arrangement. So we go down one more, uh, one more bond. We go down 2.5 degrees again. So what's the degrees on here? So, if you're normal tetrahedral, you're 109.5. If you're trigonal pyramidal, this is trigonal pyramidal up here, then you're 107. If you're, if you're tetrahedral in your electron group, but bent in your molecular geometry, like this one, this one's tetrahedral in its electron group, but bent in its uh, atomic arrangement, then it's going to be 104.5. This is water. And angular also means bent. And if you go down even more, this one's really kind of silly to write like this, but this is uh, like hydrochloric acid looks like this. Lone pair, lone pair, lone pair. That one doesn't go down by 2.5. This one's just a straight line. So that's why it's linear, 180. And so this one says like, you know, a little less than 109.5 and then way less than 109.5. I prefer you to write these for me because you'll be expecting that those are anyway. So the tetrahedral ones are the ones I'd like for you to know the specific bond angles to. Don't just say less than 109.5. Okay. Alright, easy part done. The harder ones are on the second half. I'm almost done. Probably like five more minutes. We good to go? Maybe somebody. Yeah, Thanks, yeah. guys. I just want to make sure we're okay. Um, geometry for I mean, uh, five domains are going to yield you know more complicated geometry. So these are yeah. Yeah, one of seven. Um, these are the more complicated ones where you've got those convoluted structures with the seesaw and the T-shape and all that fancy stuff. So for the first one, uh, phosphorus, extra chloride should work for that one. I'm going to double check one. I think that's right. Um, these are going to be, let's see if I can draw this in a 3D shape for you here. That's supposed to be a bipyramid, trigonal bipyramidal. Um, the vertices here are your individual atoms on the molecule. So in the axial region, you just have one lump, uh, one bond up, one bond down, and then you have five or three more bonds that you have to add, and those are going to have to go in the equatorial region. So. It makes you sound ex extremely smart when you describe it like this on the AP exam. 
axial region, equatorial region, those words are good to use so they can visualize what you're saying. Equatorial means like the equator of the earth, so we have that the middle section. Those are definitely going to be spread out as far as possible in that 360 realm that it has. So 360 divided by 3, yet again, is 120. So this one has two bond angles to them. 120 in the equatorial region and 90 in the axial, re axial region. So my, my body's the axial, axial region. My head's the first top one. My arms are the two in the middle and then there's one behind me. There's only one place this can go. It's, a, it's 90 degrees. Doesn't matter which one I'm talking about. It's still 90 degrees from equatorial to axial. But the equatorial ones in reference to one another are 120. We good with that? If you've got to get up in the middle of the test and dance like I do, it'll help. Okay. Um, the next one is if you remove one of the bonds and you replace it with a lone pair, we still have five electron domains, but we have a different molecular shape. So the best place for a lone pair is the place where it's going to have the most space. If you put in the axial region, what's the bond angle between the lone pair and everything else? 90. That's highly repulsive. So I cannot put this lone pair in this axial region because no matter what I look at, it's 90, 90, 90. That's it. So I'm going to see, let me see if there's a better situation, and there is. If I put the lone pair in the equatorial region, then in, yeah, it's 90 from the top bond and 90 from the bottom bond still, but it still has more space in the middle, which is about 120 from both of those equatorial ones. I just said a whole lot. Does that make sense? Yeah. Wait, is that facing backwards just like the other one was? Yeah, I can draw that for you. Um, a, up, to the side, back, forward, and down. Except this is a limb here. So um, that's definitely going to be, I, I say 120 here, it's actually a little less than 120 to be honest. So here is 90 still, but on the equatorial region, it's about 118 again. Um, sorry, 118, but it's between these guys, 118. So the lone pair does shift that 120 range just a teeny bit on the equatorial, but 120 is still pretty good space for the uh, electron pairs to exist. All right, so then you, so you have another lone pair you add. Still going to take the equatorial area because there's still more space there. Like I just said, same situation. Um, sorry, that first one was seesaw, by the way. This one's our T-shaped one. So this one has two lone pairs on the equatorial. Those are T-shaped one. So it does the molecular geometry is T-shaped with the electron group geometry. Bipyramidal, yeah. So it's bipyramidal for electron group all the way. Because there's still five electron domains on all of these right here. So the electron group is easy because it's the same for every single one. The molecular geometry changes every time you add a lone pair. Okay. Um, next one. Oh, and these are all 90 because, sorry, because I've got two. So there's only two spaces where you're talking about the angle anyway. Um, next one is a good example we did yesterday in class. Xenon dichloride. Um, this one, I think PCL, I think PCL3 worked for that one. Uh, what was our earlier? Uh, sulfur hexafluoride. So, this one is the like same one we did in class yesterday. The best arrangement for the lone pairs yet again are to be equatorial because that means they have 100, or they have 360 all the way around, so 120 about each. Yeah, they are 90 and 90 from top to bottom, but it, they, they prefer to be in the equatorial location if possible. Um, would this one be a polar or not polar molecule? If it were xenon dichloride, give me a guess. Why? Is it okay? So when you say that, you mean the dipoles cancel? Okay. So the dipole going up for xenon and fluorine cancels with the xenon and fluorine bond down here, and then equally 
to the left or to the back to the front and then to the side so if there's electrons all the way here and then top and bottom and they're pretty evenly distributed then it's nonpolar so this would yield a nonpolar one what about this one polar because you've got uh, electron groups that way and then a bond this way there's no way that a equatorial region is going to cancel each other out that, was de that would definitely be polar let me go back up here the next one up oh. definitely polar because you've got a humongous lone pair back here but that's kind of screwing up the whole situation so it's definitely polar all the way up here can you see five probably nonpolar as long as all the bonds are the same electronegativity difference with the same bond. That would be nonpolar. But if you had different bonds, then maybe you had like chlorine, chlorine, fluorine, hydrogen, and oxygen, then you'd have to consider your situation and probably probably would be polar. But if they have lone pairs, a lot of times you're seeing lone pairs involved, you're seeing it's polar, except for the one here, oops, sorry, here, where they are canceling each other out. Next couple are your most complicated ones. Octahedral, another name for this is square bipyramidal because it is a square. That's the, the, oof. But that is a square bipyramidal. Um, for hexafluoride should work for that one whenever you have this one they're 90 all the way because you've got a square in the middle so 360 divided by 4 is 90 and then you have your axial and equatorial angle in all four areas so it's still 90 all the way after that oh and what'd you guys say polar or not polar for that one what'd you say non because it's got equal vertices all the way around equal bonds all the way around Dipoles cancel each other out in all areas. So it should be nonpolar. Next one, replace one of those uh, bonds with a lone pair. The best place for this one would be an axial region in this case. So once you get down to six electron domains, you're going to be putting lone pairs on the axials, not the equatorials, because the equatorials already have four bonds. So that's 90 degrees from everything. That's not a good, be a good situation when you have to change it. Because what's, uh, what's 360 divided by 5? Let's just say like 75 or something. Six, between 60 and 70, we'll say. Regardless, it's less than 90, right? If I put these lone pairs on the equi uh, axial, what's their angle with everything else? Look at the lone pair here. It's axial. What's the bond with the axial and the equatorial? No, it's, it's just with 90. It doesn't actually um, push it anymore because it can't because then these get too close together up here. So this angle is 90 between the axial and equatorial, which is why the lone pair prefers to be axial here and not equatorial because like we just said, equatorial would force those bonds to be between 60 and 70, which was which is less uh, stable. So this one's called square pyramidal because it looks like a square pyramid. And then there's a huge lone, huge lone pair down here. Um, xenon, I think xenon. Hep, hep, or, um, pentafluoride does that one. If I just verify that, I'm pretty sure that's right too. Square planar is where you have two lone pairs, and so the other location of the lone pair would be as far away from the previous lone pair as possible, which would be on the totally opposite side, which would be still 90 degrees from the whole equi or equatorial region. So that one's called square because it's a square plane. And huge lone pair up top, huge lone pair down. So the bond anglers are really the biggest part that you're going to have to make sure you focus on studying, but those are the ones that are, um, you'll see repeats a lot, so make sure you memorize those bond angles. Yeah. Yes, this one be nonpolar, thank you, I was trying to do polarity on all these. Um, so this one we said was nonpolar. This would be definitely be polar because you've got a lone pair here. These lone pairs would cancel out as long as the vertices of this plane were the same as well. So then overall it would be nonpolar. We okay? Thank you. Um, your lab is what you're doing on Monday. So pull out the one of the problem sets.
Now let me pause this video.